All right, we're on the record, as they said. <laughs> Welcome. For those, for those one or two of you who have not asked the question, yes, next week is the final. It's unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon your viewpoint, our last week, our last class, um, we are going to have a test first. And I said I would hang out afterwards for anybody that has an interest in coming back to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So we'll leave that wide open. I, it makes no, I mean, I would be happy to put a plan together and do a class. I'm certainly not going to try and do it before the test because I know how you feel about the day of the test. But if you want me to do something afterwards, let me know. If you want to flee, that's OK, too. It's up to you guys. All right, so today's topic is going to start off with land use. And I had briefly touched on, in, in talking about title and legal descriptions, I briefly talked about a plat. And while this is a little bit further down the road in the land use process, I, I pulled this right off the public records, uh, as opposed to being in your, you know, in the stuff that I've been sending out. And this is an actual subdivision plat in Davie of 35 homes. Uh, once upon a time, I lived there a few years back. That's how I remember the name and number to pull it down. So what happens is a, a developer buys a piece of vacant land and lays out all the home lots and the streets. And in this case, well, I'm, I'm going to show you the, the big picture, so to speak. And then I'll only zoom in a little bit to make it easier to see. So basically, the square, the, the perimeter square that you see around here, was whatever number of acres that was legally described as legally described as these tracts up here of the Florida Fruitland Subdivision, which in itself was a, a, a large plat of hundreds and hundreds of acres back in ancient times like in the 20s, 15, you know, the teens, and the 20s, 19 teens, 1920s, um, when they just took huge areas of land and divided it into big tracts. And this consists of four of those tracts, which gets further divided up into these lots. The town of Davie has a rule, and we'll talk about ordinances and things like that. The town of Davie has a rule. Um, for single-family homes in most cases that they have to be a minimum of an acre. And I'll show you where that comes from in a minute. But it's a builder's acre. That's why you see 35,000 square feet. A, a real acre is at 43,000. Thank you. Good. Good. Excellent. Good. Wonderful. So you have all these, you have all these um, lots here. You also will see a bunch of extra lines on there. So like up at the top and the back, there's a, oh wait, up at the top and the back, there is a, what's called a, a, a swale easement. That's just to have a border between the exterior of the subdivision and the back of the house. You'll see drainage easement here. Can you see the arrow? Yeah. Okay, good. There's a drainage easement here, which is literally to let storm water go back and forth from the street to back where that swale is to get out of the subdivision. Now, the subdivision also is bordered on the east side over here by a canal, so that's where the stormwater will wind up eventually. Um, the, here are the roads. These are all private roads. are owned by the association. And in the middle is what's called the Hamlet Pond, which is a lake. If you're selling houses, that is a lake. And all of these uh, are waterfront lots that are on the lake, and of course, they cost more money. But in reality, what happened was that what you see there as the pond was scooped out by the developer in order to get the fill to make the lots in the area. Because this was all swamp, like everything else. Actually, this was orange groves, um, which is why it's called Valencia Acres. This is all part of the large orange grove. But orange groves are agricultural, and of course, they're made of trees and fertile soil called muck. And that all has to be scooped out. And you need to put a hard surface that will support a building, like a house. So they, what they do, and all over areas like Southwest Ranches and, and the less developed areas that became developed over the years, if you go out and drive around out there, you will see that almost every single house has a, a pond or a lake in front of it. 
Now, it looks like a nice architectural feature, but in reality, the people that owned the lot scooped out a hole down far enough to hit rock, took the rock, and put it where they wanted to build the house, and compacted it, and that's how they made the land stable enough to put the house in. That's how, that's how the, <coughs> part of how the drainage was done and how the land was reclaimed, because I, I may have mentioned that Broward County is named after a governor who was the guy that designed the drainage system of canals that runs through the county that lowered the water, basically got channeled the water so that it was high and dry land to build. Other, before that, this was all Everglades, this was all Swampland, with the exception of a few islands. Um, anybody ever been to um, Flamingo Gardens? Flamingo Gardens out on Flamingo Road in Davie? No? But those were literally were islands in the middle of the swamp. Um, a family settled out there. There were there, there was high points around those areas where you could drive and you'll actually go, I'm going over a hill. Anybody spend any time in West Palm? Yeah. You go to West Palm as you're going from 95 towards the downtown, all of a sudden you go over a rise. Yeah. That's so there's actually the state almost has a backbone that goes down from north to south. And like if you where the old orange bowls where Marlin Stadium is in Miami. You'll notice if, you, if you're ever in that area that there's a rise in one area, and it works its way down south. And then comes the Keys. It's like a, a ridge that goes down. That was a high, a high point, so everything sloped off of that. Anyway, was the same thing with the Coral Gables and the Coconut Grove area? Or? Well, Coconut Grove, very interesting. Coconut Grove. If you drive down Main, uh, no, not Main Island. Right? Grand. What's that? Isn't it Grand? No, sure, uh, sure. Bay Shore. Bay Shore. Oh, Bay Shore. Bay Shore. You'll see on the right hand side, if you're going south, rock. Yeah. This. Well, that's where the water came to. That was the water's edge. The water came right up to there. And eventually it receded and left, like, oh. where the, I guess the, I wouldn't call it a seawall, but that's where the difference in the height was where the water stopped. It's all been over a long period of time, not talking about weeks. <laughs> so, Anyway, this is what the plat looks like. You'll see things here like easements for lake maintenance uh, and more drainage. And something that's a semi peculiar, if you can see it on this, semi peculiar to Davy is there's a little 10 foot strip in, in, right in here that doesn't physically exist if you went and looked at it, and it was called a bridal path. It was alongside the entryway where you had a special area to take the horses in and out. Even though this neighborhood, and we're we'll talking about restrictions and some in a minute, um, this neighborhood didn't allow livestock. But Davy was always horse country, and when I first moved out there in the 90s, on the way home from work, I'd see people on horseback all the time. So that was real. Um, just to give you an idea, so here, this is called dedication. This is where the, the owners of the property are describing and saying, okay, this map that I've, that I've showed you is being dedicated to the public. We're causing this to be subdivided. <clears throat> and all of these easements and bridal paths and drainage and other things on there are dedicated for public for the designated purposes. So that's, how, that's what the plaque does. It lays all this out. Everything on this map, all these, these lines and measurements and things are placed into public records and they are affixed to the property by this instrument. So in the future, instead of you doing a, a meets and bounds description, you would be buying and selling lot 13 of Valencia Acres. And that's lot 13, it's a defined piece of property by these rectangular lines, subject to the couple of easements that are inside of it. Uh, that you don't actually see on the ground because it's one of them is an easement to, for someone to be able to go in there and clean the lake and do things like that. Um, what you don't see, I think there's a guard gate in here somewhere that they put in. And uh, this parcel over here was a tennis court, a basketball court, just because it wasn't a building a lot, it was too narrow. And so they made that for recreation. So that's a subdivision plat. And its purpose is to define all of these things. Now, the government uses the planning process just as a, as a mechanism, among other things, to impose impact fees. Impact fees are a tax, if you will, 
on the developer building this property because now the, the county says, okay, you're going to put 35 homes here. That means you have 35 families that are going to need water. In this case, this particular subdivision doesn't have sewer because everybody's got septic tanks. The sewers don't go out that far yet, um, at least in that area. But they're going to be driving on the roads and they're going to put kids in school. So, as a condition to allowing you to divide this orange grove into 35 homes, there's a mathematical computation and the county imposes impact fees based upon the number of people, the projections, and there's a very complicated traffic study that's done not only with residential, but obviously there's impact fees on commercial as well, that say that, okay, if you have someone living here, where might they be driving on a regular basis that's going to cause use of the roads, which means we either need to maintain those roads to support that, or we need to build extra roads. And they could decide that one of these residents might be working in Miami, or one of these residents might be working in West Palm, or one of these residents might be working in Coral Springs. So they have, they have scientific ways of doing all of that and doing all those studies, and they come up with a formula. It's called a traffic study, actually. They come up with a formula, and that's how they impose the road impact fees. The water is pretty simple because it's how many square feet of a house, how many toilets, how many sinks, you know, approximation based upon that. That's water impact. Because, remember, they need the money to build more water capacity, build, make the water plant bigger, whether the water is being brought in Davy uses some city of sunrise water. Um, bring the water in. So if there's more residents, you need more water capacity at the water plant. Impact fees is how it's paid for. Um, schools, same thing. More kids, more buildings. Although we seem to have, a, from what I've been reading, uh, a negative number in Broward County where the, some of the schools are actually being underutilized. And they're talking about consolidating and closing some of the buildings. I don't know whether people are sending kids to private school more, or they're not having children, or they're not living here, or the people that are living here are older, or whatever the reasons are, the numbers are decreasing. Unfortunately, what has happened, at least on the east side of town, is that these impact fees, when all these new buildings are going up, from what I've been told, I have no personal knowledge of this, um, the impact fees that were collected for the infrastructure were placed into a fund, as they're supposed to be, but then the commission decided that there were other more pressing needs than to use it for what they were supposed to use it for. And while there's plenty of capacity, the pipes don't work anymore. I'm sure everybody's seen what's going on with the sewer pipes bursting. It's been Fort Lauderdale. It's been pretty bad. It's, it's just pipes in, in nice neighborhoods where it was cracking. And the sludge, effluent, word was uh, bubbling up into the streets and you know if you live in a million dollar house in a nice neighborhood you don't really want effluent in your streets yes. it makes the grass green but it's not very pleasant for the same local professor so in we, miami the other day they had an issue with that but it's more with the wipes with the flushable wipes or the wipes that people use you know, that's, into the toilet. that's different so that's really bad for septic tanks yeah they are increasing the cost of that because every time that people send that, they need to, you know, dismantle the whole thing. And get it sure. Out and so it's a huge problem. Oh, sure. Costing a lot of millions of dollars. It's bad. I mean, so that's public sewers. Again, we have private. So which means every two years or so, you have to call the guy with the truck. So which lot did you live in? Why? I was curious. <laughs> you don't live there anymore, so it doesn't matter. 13. Right? Oh, you live in Oh, 13. 13. <laughs> Which was kind of nice because right in front of the lake. Well, there was water on two sides, which eliminates them. Yeah, because so we only had one neighbor, one one you know adjoining neighbor. Hey, you were close to the entrance. Close to the entrance. Yeah, but that's yeah. good and bad. I mean, it's good and bad because, well, because everybody has to public. Right. But it was uh, it's good. It was nice. The kids went to school here. So okay. Any other questions about the clouds? I think that's all the interesting things. Now, um, so I mentioned that all of these things are dedicated. For example, the road is dedicated. 
unlikely that it would happen. It's not going to happen in a, in a subdivision like this because this is all built out. But what would, ha what would happen if it weren't built out? Because what happened in some areas was the developer would record a plat like this and the economy went bad. Or the area didn't grow like they expected it to grow. And they didn't sell the houses, so the houses didn't get built on these lots that have been mapped out. So now you have this piece of acreage encumbered. This is just as much of an, as an encumbrance as anything else. It's, it's in the title. You, you have to go through a process to get rid of it. But now you have all of this there. And suppose someone wants to come along and say, OK, I, don't want, to, I want to buy this entire square. And I want to build an apartment complex. And I don't want to be constrained to these lots. Well, you can vacate. The process is called vacating. It's a, it is a, a petition that gets filed before the governmental agencies to make the plat go away. Or, in some cases, with a, probably a little more common, would be to just vacate the dedicated streets. So take, for example, Ashford Lane at the top. And you see that Ashford Lane divides this, these lots from those lots. So if you wanted to take the, all of those two sets of lots and make it into one big development, you could petition to vacate Ashford Lane. And the, the law is that when you vacate a dedicated road right of way, the ownership of the road, the, what used to be the road, vests in the adjoining lot owner to the center line. Okay, so the people here on the on the south side would own the south one half of the of the road. The people on the north side would own the north one half of the road, and the road goes away legally. That would only really occur if you had somebody either owning both sides, or or if there was another road down here, which there isn't because there's a lake, that served these lots and another road on the other side that served the other lots, and they all got together and decided, we don't need the road in the middle anymore. Uh, some of the older neighborhoods have alleys dedicated behind them. They have roads on the front and service alleys in the back. Hollywood, for example, and some of the older neighbors there, neighborhoods there, and that's where the garbage trucks go. And that's actually where the, the garage entrances are in a lot of those old, where the people go up the alley behind their house and park. If you didn't need it, Theoretically, as long as everybody on the block agreed, you could vacate it and everybody had a little more land for their, for their properties. That's called vacating a dedicated either plat, easement, right away. Anything that's been recorded and dedicated, I'm sure I did the dedication at the bottom of this, you're undedicating it basically, you're vacating. And this was the dedication. By the way, these are all, the plats are all in the public records where you find everything recorded. Um, I mean, all the deeds are recorded in the official records of Broward County. Broward County anyway. um, and some of them are recorded also. And you will see that it is recorded in plat book 137 at page 3. So any time you would, remember I showed you legal descriptions. So what would happen would be if I was describing lot 13, it would be lot 13 of Valencia Acres, according to the plat recorded in Plat Book 137, page 3 of the Public Records of Broward County, Florida. That's the legal description. Because you don't have to describe each dimension of it, because there's a recorded plan. It makes it a lot easier to describe land. Okay. Now, let's see if I can find the other things. So the next thing I want to talk about, that's, that's actually at the, at the, the narrowest level. This to make this easier. So I'm going to be able to find it because I'm trying to do nuts. I want to show you a comprehensive, oh, maybe I'll put that into, into canvas. A comprehensive plan. Sound familiar? <coughs> Thank you. 
you open up um, a new browser, you just type in Nova Sharply. It's on uh, it's the same computers. Should. You should be able to go back and forth, though. And if you click there. Yeah, no, I've got that part. I mean, you really should. You should I, I feel you should be able to go back and forth between Outlook and Canvas once you're logged in. Yeah. So you guys have somewhere in there. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the we'll come back to the comprehensive plan after a word from our sponsor. But, um, so the comprehensive plan is a map. That's really I mean it's a graphic to show you, but it's not it's not uh, it's not this. But the comprehensive plan is countywide and it's very broad in scope. It establishes like overall development guidelines where they say, okay, uh, I'm going to use downtown Fort Lauderdale for an example because, by the way, the comprehensive plan is also known as a master plan. You'll hear it described in two ways. Um, so they say that the tall buildings can be up to this point, and then when you go across the river, you can have a couple over here, but when you get too close to the residential neighborhoods, we want to keep it down to eight stories because we don't want the big buildings towering over the residential neighborhoods. And this section of the county, we're going to set up for industrial. And this section of the county is going to be primarily an office park surrounded by uh, high density residential. And those kinds of things can be done in the, master, in the comprehensive or master plan. It establishes overall development guidelines at a, at a broad scope. It's difficult to have it changed. You have to show real reasons, and you have to go in front of the commission to show why you should get a variance from that. It's a lot more difficult than having zoning changed because it's the county level, and it's a little tighter. The comp plan is more strictly controlled. Um, its primary purpose is to manage growth, of course, because they want to they want to say what's going to go where so that it doesn't go crazy. It, in spurts all over the place. Sometimes they lose control of their brains, which is why we have high rises popping up out by sawgrass, out in the swamp. I don't understand that at all. But they're trying to do a, a they're trying to do a, a community, if you will, around the mall. Oh yeah, see. The so I mean, first there was Tau, which is you know I don't know, 25, 30 stories tall, and you can see it from all over the place, and it just doesn't. It's not consistent with the rest of the surroundings. It doesn't make any sense to have a tower out there where you go just to the north of the mall and you have something like Artesia, which is low rise. Plenty of apartments, plenty of places to live. There's lots of land out there to spread out. You don't need to go up in the air where people are looking down into the, into the expensive homes and plantation acres. It just doesn't make any sense. But somebody got away with the question. Well, but before, the reason we don't 
really have like a master plan anymore because I thought they removed the, the, the Florida state law concurrency, concurrency law, the master. Currency, the currency is different than the master plan. Concurrency was a situation where in order to get a permit to develop, you had to prove that there was adequate capacity. Yeah, but that's what's causing all the high rise stuff now, isn't it? No. no, 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 no. The master plan, for example, I know what the master plan is, but I was always told when I was at the time they were saying that it's going to destroy the power of the master plan when we remove the precursor laws. So that's right when they're doing it. When I was in school. They were saying that when Rick Scott was trying to remove the precursor well, he did remove the precursor laws. They were saying that all the planners, you know, they were saying that's going to tear up the master plan for Robert County and, and it did. County. It didn't. It still exists. It may be easier to get around it, but it still exists. Theoretically, it protects the environment because it requires certain open space areas, parks, and things like that. Um, okay, so I can't, for some reason, get to where I want to show you the master plan, but I'm not giving it. But I am going to show you the land, the, the zoning map. This map, the pretty colors. This is the town of Davie. Um, and See if there's a legend because it's usually a legend. This may just be the map without the legend because I, I was just downloading what I could to show what, what a zoning map looks like. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Scroll over anything? Does anything show up? No. Maybe no. one of the little icons on the top left? No, it usually doesn't. It doesn't. It's tough. Legend, right there. Right there. Oh, look at that. Thank you very much. So that will show you what, how they, what they've decided, you know, what should go where. Regional Activity Center. A regional Activity Center, where do you see that? Uh, the blue. What do you think that is? Like a stadium or something? No, uh, no that's uh, probably like a uh, park. There's a clue. Not, oh, you, but you can't see the clue. You can Water see the clue. Parks. Water parks. You can see the clue. It's a little faded, but you can see the clue. Or oh, the blue place. <laughs> the blue I'm, I'm colorblind, I can't see it. Oh, it's a college. Right. That's all this whole university area. Oh, oh this center. Uh, all that blue stuff. Yeah. That's, that's Nova, that's BCC. Oh, so what are they going to Because that's what it's called. Oh. It's, it's, it's schools and universities. And I mean, IFAS is the University of Florida's <laughs> got a facility there. Um, all kinds of things are there. Bailey Hall, which is part of the Brown College. So it's, it's, it's zoned that way. Now, actually, what happened was, I think I told you this, that that was an airport once upon a time. That was an airport that was owned by the Foreman family, and they donated it for school use. That's how this whole thing started. You'll also see, if you look at the, uh, another section of blue, that's the Pine Island Bridge Country Club. That's, that, that's also. Uh, Recreation, if you will, what they call it regional activity. The other green areas are parks. So that's how they, they regulate the open space. And then, what's, what's all of these things here are the these various residential and how many units you can have to the acre. Okay, that's why all this white stuff in the middle is one to the acre, it's single family one to the acre. And that's density, and that's how they regulate it. And sometimes, sometimes a developer can go in and petition the city to get something changed. They can go in and say, okay, this area that is presently zoned one to the acre is adjoining the regional activity center, and it's adjoining commercial property, and it really isn't appropriate for large single family homes. It's much better suited for garden apartments. And they have to go through staff, they have to go through the, the planners at the, the cities, they have to go in front of the commission, and of course then there's a public hearing, and that's when the citizens come out with torches and pitchforks because they don't want you to add additional density in their backyard. And oh, I, those can be amusing. We, we, had a, we had one like that, Walmart wanted to come to the intersection of Sterling and University. And Walmart had the property under contract that was representing the seller. 
And staff was fine with it. I mean, they, they had worked everything out, but you know, for some reason the citizens don't like Walmart. They think the Walmart. Something like that happened in Miami, too. It's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they just have. They just have. Away, I want to say like Midtown or well, something. Well, it's like Midtown, we went there. So, the staff was in favor, everything was going along smoothly until we got to the town council meeting. And then the citizens came out. And they were very much opposed. And of course, the town council's people were elected. So they're going to listen to their constituents. And they turned it down. And Walmart booked the bug on it. It was a $11 million land purchase. And they went away. But they actually went down the street over a long period of time. Did they lose any money? No. No. no they're not there. Well, they're, they, they, what they lost was all, so we, we, let's roll back to the contract conversations. So remember, remember we talked about contingencies and inspection periods and all of those kind of things? And we talked about damages on contracts and things like that. So what happens is developer comes in. Now I'm talking about not just, you're not just going to buy an office building or a retail center or something. A real development situation where developers going to come in and they're going for permitting and they're, they're going to buy this 50 acre piece of land to build a shopping center. They have the right to cancel the contract and take their deposit back, but they still are going to get, they're still going to spend all the money to have drawings created, uh, site plans, hearings, legal fees, architects' fees, land planning fees, all that stuff. They're not getting that back. That's why we have arguments in, in negotiating these contracts. If the seller is the one that does something wrong, and the contract is terminated because of the seller's action, more than just taking back the deposit, the buyer is looking to be compensated for their expenses. And that becomes a negotiation as to how much. How much is the seller willing to be exposed to for the buyer's costs in trying to get the development done? If something happens where the seller can't close, can't is unusual, won't is more usual. What it is. Um, so that's what a zoning map looks like. Is there something there now? Where? At the what, Sterling University? Oh, yeah, Target. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're okay with Target, but not a Walmart, huh? Yep. Wow. However, we're going to go to University. Yeah, the northeast corner. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just go a little bit further north on University, at Orange, different developer, different set of circumstances. I don't know what was different there. You know what you find there? Walmart. But it's a few years, quite a few years later that it happened. Um, there was a developer that held on to that piece of property for years and years and years and didn't know what he was going to do with it. He had different plans in mind and eventually sold it to Walmart and they built the center. Now, that center is designed very differently because if you're driving by, you're not going to drive by and see the big open parking area and the giant Walmart stuff. You're going to see a Walmart pylon sign and lots of green because the way they negotiated, the store is actually facing, the front of the store faces north. And the entryways are on university, they're driveways. There's lots of landscaping along university so that you don't see the parking lot and you don't, I mean, you can see some of the Walmart, obviously. You see the signage, but that way, you didn't have this giant blue expanse there. Contrast, go east on Broward Boulevard, almost to 95, and there was an area over there that was, I'm not even sure the houses were still standing. There, there was old houses that had been torn down. There was a lot of vacant land there. But there were streets. Why? Because they had been dedicated years ago. Big, big, and this developers bought up block after block after block, cleared out the old properties, went to the county, and vacated the streets. Which meant that, again, using our example of the classroom, all of these areas where your seats are in between the blocks became Nothing, not streets anymore. So that the whole thing became one usable property and they put a Walmart shopping center there with lots of, now that's got lots of out parcels along Broward Boulevard. There's a Wawa, there's a, a drive through dump, uh, uh, Krispy Kreme and the 
McDonald's, big McDonald's, old racetrack that predated them, but all along there, there's all kinds of businesses in the front, but Walmart's way set back with the parking area. It does very well there. I mean, it's, you know, it's what it is. Okay. So that is what a zoning map looks like. And of course, you, know, you can, when you go and look this up, the, way this, the reason this works online, as it loads, is that you can zoom in on smaller areas. And you'll see, as you get closer in, not only will you see how it's zoned, but you will see that the streets are laid out there. This is a shopping center, it's pink. Um, this is actually a luxury manufacturing housing subdivision. Anybody know what that is? Luxury? Paradise Village? Um, no, that's Rex Mobile homes. But you, can, but you can see, if you look at that compared to some of the other areas, if you go, oops, if you go down further, wow, you'll see the density is, is huge. okay, because each individual home takes up a very small amount of land. When you move down this direction, now you see it's a little, you see how, much, how many fewer lots there are in a given area? You see the streets. So you see what goes on. Of course, different, different designs of how the neighborhoods are laid out. Some just for marketing, like, like this neighborhood. I believe this is blessed to be here. But what happens is you have one entrance, most likely with a gate, and you have all the roads to go through. You have interior lots. And by doing a perimeter water feature, again, scoop that for you know, fill for drainage, it does two things. Number one, it provides the fill. Number two, it provides drainage for stormwater. So now you have all of these exterior lots of waterfront, they sell for more money, and all the interior ones on the lake, like the one I showed you in Valencia Acres, same thing, waterfront. And that's, you know, it's got a fee. Look, it, whether you realize you're on a drainage ditch or you think you're on a bubbling brook, it's still water. It's still a nice feature to live and have, unless you don't like the iguanas and things. Whatever, if you like the wildlife, it's great, and it's, it's also very peaceful. And you get more money for it. If you're a okay. I'm trying to see if I can show you some washing. I think I showed you that's commercial. That's the plaza where the Wind Dixie is. And all these along the perimeter here, there's different kinds of, of retail and such. And you'll see here where the perimeter of Davy is, where it stretches out to little places. What's happened, another thing that's happened over a period of time is the county, the county has tried, this is statewide, has tried to eliminate the county having jurisdiction over pockets of land that are not in an incorporated city. It's harder if it's remote little pockets to provide services like fire and police and things like that. So over the years, they've encouraged the cities to annex. And so the cities have grown by, it, it's something that's really strange. Hollywood, for example. Hollywood, I think, goes all the way up to 595 in some places, which is really weird. But they were able to do that and get some commercial stuff up by the port. In fact, I think part of Port Everglades is in the city of Hollywood, where that, that it meanders goes around Dane in some places. And cities fight over that. I mean, the, the annexation of these things, I remember reading something, I was in New York, and I had gone, I was helping my daughter set up an apartment, I needed to find a target. And I get on a train, I go up to an area, and I noticed that I cross over a river, and I'm in a neighborhood, whatever the name, Maple Hill, and there was the target and a couple other stores there. Well, what I found out was, this was the only part of, Man of New York City, of Manhattan, that was not on the island of Manhattan. Because back around 1900 or the late 1890s, there was a creek. And they dredged the creek to run a canal to get from the Harlem River over to the Hudson River so that shipping could get through there. And by doing that, they cut off this little piece at the top of the island and separated it. And Later on, the Bronx, which is in, to the, if you know New York, is, is to the north of it, actually sued to say, hey, you're not part of Manhattan anymore. 
we want to take you over. And they lost. They had to keep it. So it's the only part of, of the borough of Manhattan that's on the mainland. Just, and that happens in cities. Cities fight over that to get access. I don't think Davies involved in any of that that I can see. Or, I think or uh, a few years ago, I live in Sunny Isles, and I think they took over Hollower, the Hollower area. Right? Really? Yeah. Huh. So here, So here you'll see an area which is now part of Davie. Right, this, this whole area here. This, this line, this gray line is, uh, it's Martha State Road 7, but it's 441. I happen to know this little blurb to the north here, only, which is, appears to be the only thing sticking up on the other side, is a truck dealership. And, and it's, it's a client at the time. So what happened was this whole area here was part of a separate incorporated community called Hacienda Village. It was relatively small. It was basically the intersection of State Road uh, 84 and State Road 7, also it was 441. Well, along came 595, and they decided to build 595, and they demolished all the improvements because that's where 595 is. In fact, that's where the intersection of 595 and State Road 7 is, is this whole area. And it obliterated the town of Hacienda Village. The truck dealership had been located elsewhere. They got paid for their land and were able to go around the corner and build, and, and build a new facility. It turned out to be a, you know, a nice thing because they got to build a brand new facility. But that's why you see little, where you would see a natural line of, of the angled line, which is 595 and 84, that's the reason you're going to see an irregularity in some city boundaries. And it gets, it really gets worse in different cities. I just picked Davy. And then, of course, when you get down this way, where, where it stops here is where the Seminole Reservation starts. You know, it's, it's because we're looking at a Davy map as opposed to a county map, it doesn't show that. But that's where that break would be. Yeah, I can't. I can't demonstrate the other stuff. Right okay. Any questions on the zoning map? Now, that's the map. But along with the map, and actually far more important than the map, is the code. Code of Ordinances is the laws of the municipality. It could be county, or it could be a city or town. That gets very, very detailed as to what you can do in specific areas. Let's see if I can find a district definition for you. It goes so far as to say, remember I mentioned one, one um, house to the acre. That's, that defines, that is a definition of, okay, that's a definition that's within the zoning code that says in this zone, and the zone is defined as whatever it is, uh, R1, whatever, it's, it's given a designation, and it's very specific. It'll say things like one improvement to the acre. Sometimes it'll say um, minimum sizes. Usually, usually it depends on what it is uh, and how strict it is. That's more common in finding private stuff that I'm going to get to later. Cross street parking. Uh, this is just I just pulled this up to show you the kinds of things you find in the zoning code. If if you are building something usually more commercial than residential, the off-street parking is going to tell you that you have to provide on your land for sufficient number of parking spaces for the improvement you're going to build. And by category, without spending the time trying to scroll through and find each individual category, it'll tell you that if you're building a regular office building, you, general rules, I'm you know, not, not being specific, general rules for a regular office building, you have to have four parking spaces for every 1,000 square feet of occupiable space. For medical, 
it's six per thousand. Um, restaurant, they do it by serving area with fewer number for the kitchen because of the serving area. You can have people sitting at a table, so you have to have X number per thousand square feet, but left minus some area for the, the kitchen prep where there's two chefs standing in an area that would seat 20 people. So it's all defined differently. Retail is different. Um, warehouse is different. You know, it all depends upon the use, and it's all defined in the zoning code. It's the laws, the, the local laws that govern what you can build and what you have to have as part of what you're building. Another thing that gets defined um, in the zoning code is setbacks. So again, it depends upon it depends upon um, where you are, whether you want uh, you know, properties right on top of each other. What you may see in some areas, what you may see in some areas as, um, here, these are the districts, just to give you an idea. In some areas you might see what they call McMansions, where you go to the older areas where you have the older homes, the ramp style, one floor, take, sitting on a lot, maybe waterfront, the east side of town. And all of a sudden, next to it, you will find a two-story new home that is this far from the edge of the, of the lot because they either got a variance, which they shouldn't get, or, they, or there just was no setback restriction for that, in that code for that particular property. So setback says, you can't build any closer than, for example, 10 feet from the rear, 5 feet from the sides. And that varies from community to community. Now, a variance is a petition that gets filed before the municipality to request that you can do something differently than what the code requires. For example, it's, let's say you have a, a property and it says you have to have 20 foot side setbacks on both sides. But the lot's only 50 feet. For whatever reason, the way it got subdivided, you wind up with a 50 foot lot. So if you took 20 over here, 20 over here, you only build a 10 foot house. That's a problem. A 10 foot wide house is not going to work. So you go, to the, you go and you say, hey, you know, this lot was reduced over time for whatever reason, this is how it is now. I want to build a new. I want a variance so they only have to have a five-foot setback, and that results in a public hearing. Goes to the zoning staff. Neighbors have the right to object. The, one of the most important things regarding a variance to have a to get special permission, if you will, is that it cannot be a self-imposed hardship. What I just described is a hardship where you acquired a small lot because it was already reduced down by people dividing up lots around it. So you didn't create that. But if you create the variance, I mean, you create the hardship yourself by designing your property a specific way in violation of what the code says, and now you want to ask for the variance, that is a self-imposed hardship, and that's a grounds for denying it. Not always, and they won't always get denied, but that is, a, that is a clear ground. They will always say to you when you go for appearance, it cannot be self imposed. You can't create the problem yourself. Adjoining uses. Many, many codes will say you cannot have a liquor store or to get more modern, a dispensary within a thousand feet of a school or a church or other religious facility. Sometimes a park, less often a park. Um, and by the way, for those of you who missed the question, which was not very many uh, on the midterm, that does not include the pizza restaurant or the donut shop. Or the donut shop. There was a question on the midterm about. Uh, what you can't have, true or, I think it was a true or false question about not being able to have a dispensary within 500 feet of a pizza restaurant. That was the answer? The answer was obviously false. <laughs> oh, that's false. 
<laughs> I can go back and check it and see if you got it right on the exam. I know I can fall. Let's assume, let's assume that the most, not everybody, I, mean, I know it threw a few people off, but look, that, that happens. So, but so th those are use restrictions. And they're there obviously to protect certain institutions because the, the people who created the laws, the, the, rep the commissioners who created these laws and wrote the code, did it in response to the citizens saying, I don't want you sell I don't want people selling liquor and drugs next door to my kids' elementary school. Well that's why our you know punishments are harsher when you're caught doing something bad by a school. Correct, or, same uh, concept. Like speeding, you know. Right, same concept. You're trying to are trying to protect the kids. Or the age of public. Or that or <laughs> in school. Is that a real thing? I think if you pee in get to call it peeing in public like near a school oh, or yeah. somewhere pee -pee. else it's more serious. What? If you get pee if you pee outside first of all I'm sorry. If you urinate outside in public, you could get charged with self indecency. Well it depends. Or how you think of it by a school you're No, you know, anywhere. If you get caught even if you're going to the bushes, a cop can actually charge you on the side of the road. You know how people you get on the side of the road and you run into the bushes and in Florida, you would get actually charged with indecent exposure. What if you just pee your pants? It's because you're exposing yourself. Yeah, but suppose you don't. Well, I don't know. Research is good. Research is good. But the whole thing is, if you maybe you've never been that truck. No. If you outside of a school, like say a park or a school area, sure, you're being charged with um, sexual offense. Well, okay, so along those lines, you probably, you may or may not know that, um, everybody know what battery is? And I don't, anybody pull their phones up because I'm not talking about kind of battery? Battery, 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 hit. battery a hit, a touch hit. it, hit. a touch it, not assault. assault, the difference between assault and battery is assault is threatening someone, battery is actually making contact. If you commit a battery on a person over the age of 65, I believe, that's a felony, not a misdemeanor. Yeah, I punched the old guy in the club at 67. He looks like he's 57. Well, okay, so there's an interesting question. It's funny, but wait a second. Hold on a second. We, we're not doing criminal law, but let's talk about it. I want to explore that. We literally were having a conversation. Two of us were lawyers, and one guy's a businessman. And there was an incident that one, the, the, the businessman had got, was involved in. That's why we're discussing this. So here's the question: You just you know about this law now. You maybe you knew about it before. You thought it was 57. He looks pretty good. You don't know how old he is. So when you go to take a swing, did he stop and say, "Excuse me, I'm 67. You can't hit me." <laughs> no. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have no intent to break that law. Okay. That's if you if you have, when you push your foot on the accelerator and you're doing 67 miles an hour and it says 40, you have an intent. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you don't know how old I am and you take a swing at me, you don't know if you're committing a felony because I'm not telling you. Mm -hmm. That's like the same thing. If you get a pregnant woman that's pregnant, it's also a felony because she didn't tell you she's pregnant. You don't see it. Well, come on, man. Still hit the woman. That's not good. Oh, another woman hit another woman. I'm okay. just giving you an example. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's still the same thing, right? So the intent is this okay. But the reason intent. I said that is because it's intent. It's intent. Mm -hmm. You have to have intent to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. No, because the reason I said that. Mens rea, by the way. There's Mens rea, if you want to look that up. Okay, next building over. <laughs> There's a client of mine, so literally this dude looked younger than me. And I was selling my house, and when I looked at his ID, his paperwork, he was 69 years old, a black guy. Literally, you would see this man in the club, and you thought he was 35. It's crazy. Good jeans. <laughs> literally. That's crazy. That's crazy. Good you know. jeans. Real good jeans. I'm 103. Probably eating habits, not bad, you know, three nights. Well, he's not married. He thinks he's still young. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No stress. Yeah, that's it, man. Right? Let's just make money. money. That's it. You got a high-rise condo. You're tired from like a 
railroad tracks. He used to do the, the he used to do the trains, like the long distance trains, um, the freight things. He retired early. Well, he didn't retire early, but he was doing it for a long time. He retired with a nice pension, brought him a nice home, never been married, never was had any kids. <laughs> He's behaving like a teenager every time I see him. <laughs> okay, so just to give you, the, give you an idea what the stuff looks like, the, the zoning code, I think I'm in Davy, the zoning code, just use your phone, has charts like this at the top of the of the chart are the districts. And the districts are all defined, they're all on the map actually. And then coming down, you have what you can do in the districts. P is permitted. And not permitted. Good. And there may be <laughs> Who said that? See the end with the star? What is that? You can you can you can request it. You can you can in some situations for certain uses you can make a request for a special exception. To say, hey, normally it's not permitted, but we want to be able to do this in the state without the cause. Does every state do it like this, or is it just Florida that has like this kind of setup like that? Or? For the most part, the answer is yes. Okay. It, it's a variation to one way or the other. Yeah, but it's pretty much the same. I think there's differences to it and who would administer it and how things are defined in different areas. So, um, other things we didn't talk, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to discuss. I talked about parking, I talked about setback, I talked about adjoining uses. They can, by zoning, create open space requirements to say, because it could be a park or it could just be open, because they don't want to have every last piece of real estate covered in buildings, because you need drainage and you need oxygen, so you need plants. So without that, you have a problem. Uh, height restrictions. Height restrictions are very common. Um, commercial buildings, even residential buildings. Uh, how many stories or how much height? So remember, you can, you can go into a house nowadays and you see a 22 foot ceiling. So the house could be one story and it could be 25 feet tall. Uh, so they will regulate the heights. Special areas, where do you think it would be so super important to regulate height? Airport. Very good. Absolutely. So I'm working on a project right now, and even though the building exists, so we don't have any possibility of an issue, but, and we're getting entering into a lease. But one of the things that was recommended when we were doing our diligence is just confirm with the airport authority, since it's virtually at the end of the runway, that it's okay. So that would restrict height. Um, adjoining a residential neighborhood should restrict height to some extent. Question about height. So, and where I live in Sunny Isles, there's skyscrapers going on. Maybe not skyscrapers, but buildings going up everywhere. Oh, the beach. Yeah. Is there a certain height that they need to have the, the, those big lights on top of the building? Uh, as low as the airplanes fly. So, I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't have to be on a two-story building. It has to be on like a 10-story building. There's, yes, and I don't know what that is, but that's probably a, an FAA regulation, uh -huh. not a local uh -huh. zoning regulation. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, the heights have gotten bigger and bigger. You, and I, I believe it has to do with improvements in construction techniques, because you go down like, along Biscayne Boulevard in downtown Miami, where you used to have <coughs> relatively small buildings, now it's about 50, 50 two stories. Yeah. We haven't had a good hurricane come through, you know, or a bad hurricane, I should say, come through to test that. But those buildings are all glass. They're supposed to be appropriate glass. But, you know, you get up to those heights. I can tell you from where I live, and I'm only on the 19th floor. I know for a fact you go up higher, and especially if you're in between other buildings, when the wind is crazy. Right we have a problem. I mean, we, we bought furniture for the balcony intending that if there's a storm, we want it light enough that my wife and I can pick it up and bring it to the living room. Well, the wind picks it up and moves it around the balcony. And it's a problem. On the we, we, lost the one. we did lose a cushion once, <laughs> which, you know, which, I don't know what happened to it. I don't know what happened to the person. Anyway, hopefully you heard it. But one day there was a kid, cushion was missing. So these things, I mean, we strap them down, we tuck them in the corners, we do all kinds of things like that, which you got to worry about. So anyway, height restrictions have reasons. Then you got issues where the business, there's at least one building I know of in Sunny Isles that's, you can take your car to up to your apartment. Oh, the portion of it's only the apartment. I think it's South Beach now. Is that kid of the apartment? Yes. There's an elevator that you drive your car into, and it goes all the way up to whatever floor you live on, and you drive it into your garage. 
which is part of your apartment. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's nice. <laughs> well, it's nice, except that I've learned from clients in the construction business that those elevator shafts are subject to issues when there's heavy wind. Wow. So, so like in the Porsche building? No, I'm talking about the Porsche building. Yeah, yeah. Porsche. Yes. I don't think there's anybody else that does it that way yet. Okay. So cool. I mean, these are all issues. And so they have, they've, the height restrictions have cut off, at least in those areas, they don't care because it looks nice and they sell you it. Take away my money. Money. You have no right to view. That's a very interesting. I'm glad you said that because, you know, in talking about height and open space and zoning, we've got litigation going on right now. My clients bought the narrow lot. And they're building a nice house and they're building, um, they've gone through all the appropriate approvals. Well, the next door neighbor who is an occasional resident because they have other residences in other places, came back and they were noticed on everything. All of a sudden they started squawking because the one is that? Huh? The complaining. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, because number one, the client had built a gazebo by the pool. Not gigantic of height, but normal, whatever it's supposed to be, but it's down, the house has to be on the beach. Um, and so the neighbor, if the neighbor turns their head this way, they can't see down the beach anymore because of the gazebo. And that upset them. Wow. You can see your beach go this way, except that you have too much landscaping. But they turned their head. Then they did get a variance because there was a roof height restriction. And they wanted to have a sun deck on the roof. It's a narrow property. And they got a restriction to put a railing around the sun deck. And the railing, not the rest of the building, the railing was, you know, this much above what the, the height restriction. So they went out of variance. Noticed all the neighbors as you're supposed to. Nobody objected. These people came back well after the fact and squawked, objected. Got a lawsuit. So we're fighting. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Yes. It's crazy. No, no, it's crazy. Too much money. Really, no. no yes. No, but James, you're right. That's, that's exactly the answer. I, every time I'm at a real estate where I've dealt with people that are like bothering their neighbor, and then you reevaluate the argument and the discussion, it's just I want to show you to have more money in you, and I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. That's right. He's the man. So, how's it going? So. <laughs> Another thing that gets regulated by either zoning or more, more frequently by trying to get around the zoning is special physical characteristics. Special or specific? Special. Is it the thing specific? All right, specific. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go both. So, specific. I know where I, I, know where I put that. Physical conditions. Right. So let's come back to our, my example du jour. Town of Davie. Town of Davie actually has somewhere in their code a requirement that buildings have to have a western look. Oh. Now I'm sure they've relaxed it. To, oh yeah. I'm sure, remember, Davie was a rural town. And Davie, I, I, you'd see people on horses all over the place in Davie, regularly. So anybody go to Shorten's Barbecue? All right. You go around the back, not only is there a hitching post back there, but there is a sign ring bell for us to water your horses. Wow. And it's legit. People do go on horseback. So. I well, always we go to the shore you down in Miami. Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, they may have <laughs> had their two. Oh, or, or, okay. No, well. Capital or Westchester? Like they, like they, then. Okay, okay. Yeah. But okay. I enjoy okay. that. That actually. Yeah. That is probably. That's a, no, that's a. The best. Yeah. But, but, really good. here's the difference. I'm sorry, this is a commercial. If you like sweet, if you like sweet, sticky barbecue sauce, it's not for you. It is a vinegar-based barbecue sauce with all kinds of flavoring and chunks, probably of meat and such, in it. That is incredible. But if you're a sweet sauce guy, it's not the place for you. They may have it as well, but that's not what it's known for. I'm glad so that they, they, they finally added air conditioning. Then you don't put any sauce on your bones. It's good. They like, put no sauce on. Yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? So the one in Dayland. Of course, it was rebuilt after the fire. If you've been there, you've seen the pictures of the fire. Yeah. yeah back in the window. That restaurant predates the shopping center. Oh, uh, for yeah. sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. That goes back to the 50s, early 50s. Okay. 
Sorry. So, really good. I was doing a, a transaction, McDonald's I was doing a transaction, building the two stores I know of in David. The one I was involved with was actually on 441 and Griffin. Uh, there's a gas station on the corner of the McDonald's, and my client was selling the land to them. And that, wasn't, that one wasn't so bad, but the guys from McDonald's were complaining bitterly because the one on Sterling and, I guess, Davy Road, as opposed to Davy Boulevard, Davy Road there at Sterling, they had to do Western look because that's what the zoning required. Well, as you can imagine, McDonald's comes into town with cookie cutter plans. Mm -hmm. they, they build, you know, they go to a place, this is the size. Now they change them from time to time, but they, they come in with a set of plans that's their standard plans that go into the, to the town to get it approved. And here's our plans. We're going to do a prototypical, those are the magic words, prototypical McDonald's. Here's their town looks at it. Okay, move it a foot this way, set it back a little more, put another tree here. Great. Not dating. Got to have a western look. Got to have some architectural features. Got to have the hitching posts, stuff like that. That's the specific physical characteristics. Thank you for correcting me. Now, <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about a special, unusual. I mean, there was a house, and I'm sure this was just a question of getting the architectural plans approved. Anybody ever hear of a company called Wacken Hut? <laughs> Wacken Hut Security. Yeah. Right, exactly. I went, to, I went to high school with one of their daughters. Okay, you from the Gables? Mm, I went to Palmetto. Palmetto. Okay, so, all right. So, I don't know, maybe it was a granddaughter, who knows? So the, old, the founder of the company was a guy named George Wackenhut. And he was... They're running cops, by the way. They're, they're, <laughs> if you go to Weston, for example, and you go into, to, into one of the neighborhoods that has a guard gate, you're going to see the starched uniforms, the big badge on the Smokey Bear hat. And it's going to say Wackenhut Security all over it. Yeah. They're expensive, but it's a, it's a lot nicer when we... In that little neighborhood I lived in with 35, when I first moved there in the mid-90s, we had a security guard. And when you have a security guard and you have to pay for it amongst 35 homeowners, it's expensive. And we couldn't afford the $15 an hour guards. We were getting the $7 an hour guards. They don't look so good. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have starch uniforms. They, uh, they don't communicate very well. And you're lucky if your guest gets to your house as opposed to somebody else. Anyway, <laughs> we, we went, a, after several years, we went electronic and it worked out much better. And our association expenses plummeted, which was great for the homeowners and for the values of the property. Anyway, where I was going with this, George Wackenhut, I don't know how he got his start. He may have been a prison guard. Um, he may have been a cop. But he started this company and built it into a huge company that not only does rent to cops, but they operate prisons as well. Oh, That's yeah. one of their businesses wow. also. You know, it's not a whole lot different. Yeah. Maybe they sell to G4 or something. Yeah, Geo, I think. Geo or something. something. Geo group. Yes, correct. Well, George is dead. He's long gone. Oh. But he built a house in the Gables Estates, which is a beautiful neighborhood down in Dade County, mm -hmm. or Miami Dade County, yeah. if you can yeah. resist. Um, and it's Miami Wade County today. It is, it is, it's got turrets, it's a castle, it is literally a castle, and you, they were talking about Wackenhut's castle, that those are special physical characteristics. Thank you for calling my attention to the verbal type. I talked about variances already, which is good. Okay. So now, let's get rid of this. Anybody want to go? Anybody, any other the, questions? What was this, the special district creation on the variance part? I'm going to talk about the districts of taxation. Okay. I'm not sure why I put it in some. Maybe it's. Oh, all right. I don't remember what that was. So, we're working on a development to build apartments in an area that's primarily retail and office. And so using political um, connections. Consult. No. No, we have a my firm, is, my firm my firm has a very good land use department. And they've been in business the guys who been before they joined us were well known throughout South Florida for years and years. And 
So that's who this, my, I gave my client referred to, I referred my client to them for this project. And what they did was they convinced the city of Oakland Park to create what's called an overlay district, which means that within this one area, to create a special district to allow for improving and redeveloping <coughs> and to add resi multifamily residential into the district that was primarily commercial. That's, so like in, they created that a district. Be like that way. It's going to be opening a little retail in, in a residential area or something. No, that would that would wouldn't be used for that. It's broader than that. Oh, right. It's also expensive to do, so you would never do it for just a little retail. And you could probably always do a little retail, the right kind, in a little pocket in a residential area. Because there's always going to be that that uh, community business facility. Yeah. Federal Highway North for Belton Park Boulevard North. <coughs> you know where there's a big round building, big round office building? That's, that's, yeah, that's a chance sitting by the Correct. Chairs. Those are two separate buildings. Yeah. From there north. Okay. You know where Pure Platinum used to be? Bahama Breeze is in there too, right? That's where we we didn't we didn't go in that, that tiki, tiki tiki tiki. That's further up. Ma, yeah, my car. My car. Right? That's yeah, a that's a couple blocks up. Time, yeah. But there used to be a strip club there called Pure Platinum. Okay. Solid gold. Solid gold and pure platinum. Mm -hmm. They both got torn down. Right, but the pure platinum site is what I'm talking about. Solid gold was a little further away. Yeah, well, they weren't next to each other. Pretty much. Not on the same site. Yeah, they were. I think so. Yeah. Solid gold was right. It was the Chase Bank, solid gold. Pure platinum was right across. Right, right, right. So where the Bahama Breeze is, and where the other two, where the uh, the liquor store and the chicken place is, yeah. right, that, that's where one of them was. I'm talking about the one. It was actually the one right across the river. It was actually the Bahama Breeze is the one you're thinking of. Solid gold. Right. So the pure platinum site was on the other side of 33rd. Yeah, what's there now? Right now it's vacant. Yeah. Want to buy it? It's being site plan approved. 250 units. Oh, you know what? It had, yeah, it has a gate around it. Right. What is it going to be? Apartments. Oh, is it? All we need is a developer. <laughs> it's site plan approved, ready to go. How much? Uh, 12. Do I have All right, we've done enough. Okay. 100. I think 250 some odd? Yeah. I think that's the number. I, 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 can, to me, I can get you all the information you need. Also a commercial, sorry. <laughs> um, I want to do, I passed here a couple of days ago and I wanted to do a lunch, but it seems like I that Bahama race place, it, it just looks like a sit down. It's right, right. Oh, there's tons of places to look. I mean, that's, that's, that's like a restaurant. I mean, this isn't by zoning or anything else. It's almost by happenstance and or design. That whole stretch from sunrise to commercial has been historically a place where new restaurants try, try out. Um, either to try or they become established or it's the first beachhead of things. There's all kinds of restaurants, chain and otherwise, through there. Some good, not some so-so. Yeah, we so -so. tried that. I'm a big Bahama Breeze fan, but I don't like that. I tried it the other day the first time. It's hard. <laughs> okay, so what happens? You know, zoning changes. Zoning changes because things in the neighborhood change. I'm not talking about getting rid of the pure platinum, because that wasn't necessarily, there's only change commercial is commercial. Well, the overlay district allowing for the, the residential held things. But things happen. Areas change, and the cities decide to change the zoning and take something that was commercial and make it residential, or something residential and make it commercial. All kinds of things happen. What happens to you when you're sitting there with your property it's, it's operating, it's improved, it's something. And all of a sudden, the zoning changes so that you are not doing what the zoning permits in that. The the grand grand grand. Well, that's yeah. a simplification, yes. Legal non-conforming use. Yeah, cheating. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's got the outline open. <laughs> that is correct. It's what happens when the improvement predates the zoning change. You can't increase the use of it, so you can't expand the use, you can't take a 2,000 square foot legal non-conforming use 
and make it a 4,000 square foot legal non-conforming use because you're improving it. Also, if it gets destroyed by fire, storm, or shipwreck, then you can't rebuild the same thing again because of a less doubt. You get that. That's a situation where you have a hardship and you could go for a variance and you could say, look, my family business has been at this location, Shorties. Everybody knows where Shorties is in Kenya. This business has been there since 1950. And everybody in South Florida knows that it's, this is. Now, they had a huge fire because the building was made of wood. And it just burned. Because, I don't know, having a wood building and an open flame cooking area yeah. inside, it just doesn't seem to be yeah. smart to me. Well, they're not an engineer, but. <laughs> But so, they go silverware. It's all classic. Now they're so. I mean, that's that's like old timers go. Shorts with silver. What's the matter with you? <laughs> that was silverware. Still great food. Um, still great food. Um, anyway, so you could now go in front of the, the, the town council or commission and say, this location is key to my business. My business. I just. I, I need permission. I'm not gonna make it bigger. I'm not going to expand it, but I want to put the back. I didn't cause this. The hurricane caused this. I want to, and that's where, you, that's where, that's right for a variance. That's a situation where, where you would probably get it. For example, another example would be uh, in Doral, that it changed from being industrial commercial and they still have those uh, lands, like with the cows and all the stuff that these people are. Okay, so two things with that. Like 107 and. 41st. Yeah, 41st. Two things about that. Number one, yes, it's a legal non-conforming use. It's no longer agricultural. But when you have agricultural use, you get tax benefits. You get an agricultural exemption. Okay? And as soon as you stop using it for agricultural, they're going to tax it for whatever its use should be. Mm -hmm. So, you all know where the Broward Ball is? The Broward Ball. Oh, Brown Road Mall. Brown Road Mall, here at University Drive, not far from here. Mm -hmm. So when that was being developed, it was cow pasture. Mm -hmm. Everything out here was, you know, rural. All of a sudden, you drive by, and the cows are walking around fire hydrants. Mm -hmm. Because they put all the subdivision improvements in there to build the shopping center, but they left the cows to keep the agricultural exemption. <laughs> And it was legit because the cows were still eating the grass there. It was still being used for that purpose. But they wanted to preserve that tax exemption as long as they possibly could. Wow. Well, it's, yeah. Well, what happens? No, because what happens, I will tell you that people try and play games with that. And what will happen is they'll try and have. Cow dinner? Forget the cows for They'll have two oh. horses. Yeah, they'll have horses. Oh. They'll have two horses. Yeah. And they'll try and claim it by their house. And they'll try and claim an ag exemption for it. No, it's it, those are your pets. Oh, uh, there's a big business of cow rigging. Of cow rigging, which are people that own cows rent cows out for the year to put them on land. No, <laughs> so, so it's a whole business. Okay, but, but and they move them around. They move them around like right before November. They move them around. So like you'll see like one will have it's one cow. January. Yeah. So I have one cow right before like. Right before the tax appraiser comes, you'll see like six cows on there. <laughs> Actually, what, what happens, the, 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 the real technique that's done is you're leasing the land to the um, agriculture operator, not renting the cows. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm, well, I'm just trying to tell you, this is what it looks like to me because the cows are moving. I was like, <laughs> in terms of lease size, the and then, then when they're done, the cows are moved to the next location. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So what? I'm a little tricky since the, the tax. <laughs> what other strategy can that landowner have to keep that land besides the taxes? You know, maybe for future value? Or oh, you know why he's keeping the cows on there? No, why, keeping why, the why, they, why, why they don't develop? Why they just keep it like that way? It's not ready. He, he, yeah, he thinks it's not ready to develop. So, so let's say today, he thinks, he thinks remember, the less land that's available, the more your piece of land is just value. Yeah. So he's waiting. Yeah. He's waiting for our next big highway. I've been I've been in Miami for like 20 years now. I know, like 15 years, and it's still the same. Like 15 years. You know, um, it's crazy. 
Okay, I don't know if you've ever been to Boynton. I grew up in Boynton, New York. Florida University owned this piece of land next to IBM. I don't know if you know the old IBM center for Motorola. Mm -hmm. they had the, for Motorola had their big center back in the day. So next to that was a big piece of land, big, big huge piece of land. Florida, Florida University donated whoever got it at the time, or I think IBM, somebody had got land, or somebody, or somebody donated to Florida University. They parked cows on there for like my whole high school, elementary school. I grew up there, was always cows on that land. All of a sudden, now they have high rise, Publix, uh, Target, shopping center, movie theater, all of it's on that land from now. So what you're saying is my 20 years of life, nothing was on that land. I was born and raised there, right? That's right. Do you know what I'm trying to tell you? But now, 20 years later, that's unrecognizable. That whole area is unrecognizable. I'm going to give you another parallel. It's funny because you were mentioning Doral on 107th and 41st. If you go out 25th Street, I believe it is, mm -hmm. it's all developed now. Going mm -hmm. out 25th Street west of, west of the Palmetto. And if you go out, I'm not sure what's, what avenue it is, but on the north side is an old cemetery. I believe it's Lakeside Memorial Gardens. Nobody? No. It's out there, okay? And I know it because family's out there, and it's been, it, it's probably, to tell you the truth, it's probably predominantly a Jewish seminary, cemetery, or there's a big section. So you go out there, and you, well, there may be only one section, and you will see old Miami names there that go way back in history, family names. When that cemetery was originally created, there was nothing. You you go out 25th Street, and it was just nothing. You don't put cemeteries in the middle of town. You put them out in, where there's a right farm. And I, luckily, I hadn't been there in a long time, and I went out there for a funeral, and I just could not believe the amount of development. It's crazy. Similarly, you mentioned Boynton. I went to a funeral at another Lakeside Memorial Gardens on 441 yeah. in Boynton Beach. And when I went there, and it's a few years back already. There was nothing around there but agricultural. And I'm thinking to myself, after I've been to the one in Miami, I'm thinking, oh my God, Only what a place to buy the land up. Mm -hmm. Because this is going to be like that in, in a few more years. So you speak of that. You know 441 there? Sure. That area? When I was in high school, graduated in 2000, right? That road was a two-lane road with nothing but oranges and tomatoes out there. No subdivisions, no houses. The only neighborhood that was out there was mostly a lot of doctors and Jewish people that was like down the street from that neighborhood that had these huge mansions out there. And the only reason I would ever go out there is a kid that was in high school with me that lived out there and threw a house party. So, wow. now I go there, it's like, that's the way I, I live out there now. And that's the way I got to come to school. I have to go through there to go to Iron Five. So you know, you know where Flamingo Gardens is and Flamingo Road from 595 South? Yeah. Flamingo Road, was two lanes, just as you're describing, with a canal along the side that you'd want to fall into. And because we would take our kids, but I mean, I'm going back 25 years minimum, maybe closer to 30. It's nice. And it was nothing. And you go out there, and there's a place called Flamingo Gardens, which is a like a park, and they had a petting zoo and all. So it would be a day trip from Hollywood to go out there, and there was nothing there. It was the same thing. It was two-lane road and all oranges and cows and whatever. And now look at it. Now there's subdivisions on both sides. It's six lanes, and it's a major throughway north and south through there. So that's development. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're here. That's the D in the in the, in the, in the program we're talking about. Right? They have yeah. they, they have uh, also they just built this whole new city out in West Lake, West Lake, West Lake. West Lake. It's on the other side of Waxahachie. And you know how he was saying that Davy had the ordinances where you can't. Do the buildings without making it. Um, they created their whole city called Westlake. Yeah, Westlake. You know why they did that? Because um, Lasahachi, it's crazy. If you're in Palm Beach and you have to drive from Palm Beach to go through Lasahachi to get to Lex, it's like you're driving to Miami. It's that far out there. Really? If you, I don't know if you work in Palm Beach, but the reason they had to build Westlake outside of Lasahachi because Lasahachi has that ordinance where they have to have door roads. They can't overbuild. Really? It has to be church. It has to be a horse. Everything. They have like one Publix, one like 
small Walmart, like two gas stations. So this is like a huge city that they just made it country. They don't want nothing. Yeah, Mento is the developer. Mento is the developer, but what Mento had to do, Mento had to go right outside Loxahatchee and create West Westlake and let the county let them do that. And now they're building Westlake. Now Lox, because you gotta go through Loxahatchee to get to Westlake. So now Loxahatchee's complaining because all these people are commuting back and forth. Yeah, because so they're close. Because now it's a luxury city. If you look at what it's, they're building this crazy luxury house for a million dollars, from 400 to a million. Um, they're offering, like, they got a dirt bike park. That's how, inside the H, inside the community, like a dirt bike park, DMX park for your kids. Wow. You said DMX? I thought I heard you say DMX. Like, you know, DMX thing. DMX. DMX. DMX, DMX. DMX. you got to have So I think you're like, what is so just an example. And by the way, just for those of you that are interested in looking what codes are, I, I just pulled this down off Unicode. Unicode is a, a service. It's on the internet. It's easy to get. And you can get pretty much any municipality's code of ordinances. If you go, in most cases, like I went to Davies' website, the town's website, and they link you to Unicode so you can get all this stuff. So this will give you an idea just in preserving their rural atmosphere. They talk about what kind of fences, what color fences, split rail fences. I mean, that's old Western style. They don't say Western style in it, but when you look at the standards of what it is. However, take a look at this paragraph here, where it says, believe there's a hardship adhering to one of the fence styles, blah, 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 and what you can do, and how to do it. So they, they write in the ordinance that are telling you how you can get relief from the rules if it's a problem. So other things, someone was asking, well, it doesn't really apply to, someone, someone asked about a store in a residential area. There are, there's a, a section called exclusions by right. And exclusions by right are specific areas of the law where you can put something inside, for example, a residential area that's not a house, church, school, a park. Those are called exclusions by right. Just, and that's just examples. By the way, I'm not, church is just what was in the book. It can be any religious uh, facility, not denomination. Somebody brought up the special use permits or the special exceptions in the, when, when I showed you the chart, and there was the end with the star. So the special use, you can do it within the zoning category, but they want to control it, so they're required to come forward with additional requests, additional um, information about what you're going to build to get a special uh, exception, a special allowance, to allow additional governmental control. And so, for example, it lets them say where they're going to put a golf course or a hospital or something like that where the municipality wants it but wants to be able to control that it's not going to be right up against your, your bedroom window. And it's funny because you hear this, it sounds great in theory, but I had one of these situations where I had a family, they had a home on a street, and the town wanted to put a fire station next door because they needed, the town had been trying to find, this is Dania, they were trying to find the fire station location to serve a particular area of town. Of course, there was a public hearing and all. And the design had it where the fire trucks would go right by the elderly grandmother's bedroom window. Mm. And so my client went to the, to the hearing and, you know, to speak out against it. I remember specifically she was going to get up and, and explain this and talk. And as she goes to get up, she turns to me and says, should I cry? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, whatever you have to do to make a public presentation. So, Especially, you got to fight some of that stuff. And in the long run, the fire station got built there. And they bought her house from her. She was so she. They all. Everybody won. Remember, I talked about eminent domain condemnation. So rather than rather than have the improvement that was necessary blocked, they determined it was a public purpose, and by buying the house, they were able to make a better accessible driveway for the fire trucks. 
Okay, I think that's a good break point. Uh, 2.15, let's hit the stretch, and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll try to see this. Oh, Man, how you come along the one that uh, does Argus? Yeah. Like class. The, uh, and he pushed the due dates, right? For uh, I'm not a big fan uh, of the to March 2nd. But that works yeah. out for me because it looks like a lot of set up. <laughs> when you did a presentation to the next one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was set up. Yeah, like the going to be on March. I don't know what to do for it. I can't find like construction principles. You guys it online. He, it's kind of confusing from March of five to March of six. He's I'm not sure we're supposed to use the old. <laughs> he, the even old if he did use the old one, he's trying to explain for you that he set it up. It's not like he did it, but he didn't do a video for it. It's not. He didn't do a video for the. And he talked about a lot of stuff, but he didn't do the videos for them. So what I want to do is I want to work through it this weekend, tonight or tomorrow. So I'm going to come see him all. I'm going to come see him all. Who's the one that did me? Tony. What are his offices? Tuesdays and Thursdays. I don't know. That's why I didn't make the time for him to look it up. But I'm going to have to call him what are you? So he does a lot of the classes. Him and Ford. Yeah. What's going on, Rob? Yeah. What are you? Like, what's the... The last... Yeah, he's kind of annoying. Like, even like... Like, like... Like, well, Argus developer is the one that we know that. Like, the way he grades. He had, he had like a model look and he didn't mm -hmm. post anything. Like it was just black. Yeah. yeah. I emailed him about like three times, didn't answer, called him, and then like a day ago I got an email from our final. And he said like, oh, they're up now. So like he said, like, he put up the PDF for the midterm and a lot of instructions over there. Yeah. You were like mid -term. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you, the part Thank we finished you. to teach us for the midterm, module six and module five, it's still confusing. Would, you know, like, that last part he has to teach us for the midterm that we're going to be testing uh, like, on, you didn't like, really, quick conclusion yeah. you know, you got to watch module yeah. five. Like, I'm confused yeah. after watching module five. I'm starting to get confused. Like, he jumped real, like, he didn't really explain the transition. And then just humiliating. Yeah, he confused. Like, the beginning was fine, but what he just did now, he didn't build us up to it. I didn't want to say that. It was insane. Right. Yeah, but five, he threw a lot of the concept videos in there, but he didn't really give you, he didn't really explain it. Oh. Yeah. Go listen to him. You don't have a choice. Next semester, both classes are him. You mean next 
That's the one that's at this time study. next semester. Yes. So the next half, yeah. So is this quizzes and a case study? Quizzes, case study, and. A case study means paper. What are you taking in the semester? All this is case study. It doesn't really go into other What are you taking? Next semester? Yeah. The construction class. The one we're talking about. The principles? Yeah, I'm taking that one. That's the one that's at 12, right? 1230. I don't know, but it is. Huh? 1230, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the other one, what is it? It's another. Development. Development. You took it. No, I haven't taken that yet. That one for development. Are you taking it? Mm -hmm. I think this so one has, has a paper. Yes. This one has papers, yeah. right? I'm trying to avoid papers. Yeah, me too. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know about development. I only the summer I could do that. The, 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 the summer I could do papers right so, now. So, so what about the, the one, the construction one? Does that have a lot of uh, papers? Papers? I don't know. Like it just it said there's a case study, there's three or four quizzes, and then there's um, site visits. Site visits is cool. Yeah. I don't like the case studies. Well, you don't know what it might be. If it's not, if it's a case study, you can Or if it is the regular case study that we're used to seeing, like, you know, it's, it's going to be <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't matter. Right. I guess I'll see no, what it is in those classes. Where do we start? We have one yeah, break. We have That's it. Yeah, yeah. one week break. But what my problem is next month is crucial because my wife and the next six weeks is due any time. Oh. oh, man, congrats. No, she's eight months. But, you know, eight months. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, anything can happen. I have a 14-year-old. Yeah. And, was, uh, and my wife is the one that helps you. Yeah, my wife. Uh, <laughs> so that's really the problem. <laughs> well, I write my papers, but I ain't got no time. No, no, I write my papers, but I got no time to come to school and have somebody revise it and yeah. crafts it out. So she, she, when I write it, hey, take care of it, and I don't want to put that on. So we, for for one of those courses, we have to buy the class, and then for the other one, it's not required. Uh, we have to buy the text, but the other one is not required. I don't know, I haven't but I'm not going to buy the test, the tests of the, the book until the first day. Until the first day, because it, it's not going to happen to me like a hundred dollars or hundred dollars. What do you mean? Oh no, 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 no. They, they yeah, have all the books. Since we did only one book, I think we really used was. Um, the GIS book. The one that we use. That, that's the book is we use it for three classes. The GIS. Uh, the GIS oh really? Uh, oh, I just rented it. I didn't buy it. That's for three classes. Oh, San Miguel's class. Oh, Sam yeah. class. Oh, class. Also, uh, class. Yeah. And then this investments class. Oh, three classes. Wow. wow. I get it too. I don't know. I get it. I need to buy books. That's crazy. No, I, I, I purchased it for this spot. Well, I, I huh? <laughs> you saved good money. Right? <laughs> yeah. I know. I purchased it's a few happy hours there. Yeah, it's it's very nice happy hours. No, I like the books. I yeah. like them because I go back and them. It depends on what kind. Like, for example, the, the law book. This so I should have pretty good, but what I'm seeing, whatever this book, this book here, it's the I didn't read it. For yeah. Dino, this book? The I told you that I took the, the class from the from the real estate. Same much thing. Same. Yeah, same no, book. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> so that's great. That's what I go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Saying. This book is like it's the same thing as a real estate class, but it's mm -hmm. nationally instead of the Florida one. Yeah, and it's more commercial. Yeah, right. 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 But I started reading a couple of books. Like, ah, no, right. 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 I'm, I'm signing up for the for the test. Which one? 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 You don't have to take the 60 hours. Oh, you don't have to do this. Yeah, but I already took the course. Uh, you still have to take the test. I'm um, right now I'm trying to uh, do my, I have to go to Georgia next week or so, I'm trying to switch um, yeah. to mutual recognition in Georgia to get my first one over there, but I have to go sit over there to get 40, 40 questions. questions. Yeah. You're broken, right? Mm -hmm. I realized that I... I've got my, I got my license at home, that's back in 2003. 
Nice. So I so bring up the physical for a long time. Right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I was I was right. That's when I got the other one. I'm 39. 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 I'm to your daughter or that's, uh, yeah, kids, uh, is to pay them for, yeah, for the rest of the license. Even if they're not, 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 not